Hello, my name is Angela Dispensieri. I am a hematologist uh, at the Mayo Clinic, and I'm going to talk to you today about why is amyloidosis so often misdiagnosed. So the top three reasons for misdiagnosis are, number one, many different symptoms and presentations. Two, if providers consider amyloidosis, they may get confused about how to screen appropriately. And then number three, a provider makes a diagnosis of amyloidosis, but does not follow through on the typing. So let's go through this. So this is a survey of a, a number of patients who reported what their symptoms were uh, predating their amyloid diagnosis. And you'll notice that fatigue, shortness of breath, edema, some dizziness are the most common symptoms. There are others also listed on the slide, as you can see. But these are common kinds of symptoms, and the vast majority of patients presenting to their primary care with these symptoms do not have amyloidosis. So this is not going to necessarily be uh, top of mind uh, for your primary care provider. Now, if we move Oh, and the re part of that is, you know, in medical school, we're taught uh, if you hear hoof beats, uh, think horses, not zebras. So don't think of the ultra rare, think of the more common things. Um, again, because there are so many symptoms and so many different potential organs that are involved, um, patients may then be referred to specialists um, based on these different organs that can be involved by amyloid. And so, for example, uh, a patient may be seen in cardiology because the he or she is has symptoms of congestive heart failure, shortness of breath, um, fatigue. Um, but when one looks at the echocardiogram or the MRI, one notes that there's diastolic dysfunction instead of systolic dysfunction. Also, if an MRI is done, you can see that there may be delayed gadolinium enhancement, or if a troponin is ordered for one reason or another, this may be persistently elevated or if a bone scan, a technetium uh, pyrophosphate scan is ordered, um, but there may be uptake in the heart. So these are things that might cue a cardiologist into the diagnosis, but that said, um, it, it doesn't always happen. Um, there are kidney symptoms, so the nephrologist, because there's protein in the urine, usually with a preserved um, glomerular filtration rate. A hematologist may see, for example, an AL patient, and so the, and these are doors to both AL and ATTR. Um, a, a patient may see a hematologist with monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance or smoldering myeloma, multiple myeloma, with, quote, atypical features, meaning some of the symptoms that were described on the last slide and some of the signs that are being described here, but may not key in on that. Gastroenterologist, again, only about 15% of patients will have GI involvement, um, you know, presenting with malabsorption or hepatomegaly, um, gastrointestinal bleeding. Again, neurology, again, about 15% of uh, amyloid patients, um, autonomic dysfunction, which could be erectile dysfunction, uh, it could be uh, constipation alternating with diarrhea, uh, lightheadedness or small fiber neuropathy, meaning uh, tingling or burning in the feet. And even the orthopedists may be seeing these patients with because they have carpal tunnel syndrome or spinal stenosis or pseudoclaudication. And so there are many opportunities for um, clinicians to make the diagnosis. But again, these findings um, can also be other things. But when patients have many of these things, um, one really needs to be thinking. And so this difficulty uh, basically um, is shown in patient's journey, slow road to diagnosis of amyloidosis. Again, patient survey information. And you can see that only 37% of patients are diagnosed within six months of their symptoms, whereas another 37% uh, or so, it takes more than a year to get a diagnosis. And again, about a third of patients will be seeing five or more doctors in order to get to their diagnosis. And also, if you look at who's making the diagnosis, a third, hemonc, uh, 
nearly a quarter by nephrologists and less than 20% by cardiologists, um, which is really a travesty given the fact that, you know, 70 to 80% of patients with amyloidosis will have cardiac involvement. I think that that is getting better now and there's a higher awareness. So what is amyloid? Well, it is a disorder of protein misfolding, which leads to insoluble amyloid fibril deposition in organs and tissues throughout the body. And so on the right-hand side, you have sort of a cartoon showing that green amyloid fibril depositing within the myocytes of the heart and causing enlargement of the heart and uh, a reduced cardiac output. And there are over 40 different proteins known to form amyloid in humans. So it is a complex problem. The two most common types of amyloid, however, are light chain amyloid or AL, where the protein factory are those little purple cells in the bone marrow in that cartoon. Um, they make immunoglobulin light chains, and those then can form amyloid and deposit in many different organs causing symptoms. The other is transthyretin amyloid, where the protein factory is the liver uh, for a protein called transthyretin. And that uh, is, again, it sort of comes apart, misfolds, and can deposit it most commonly in the heart and the nerves. Um, and there are two types of this transthyretin amyloid. One is a hereditary form, which we call a variant form, which is something that's a mutated a protein that typically can be passed um, from generation to generation. Um, but then the more common is the ATTR wild type, where there's no mutation. It's a we also call that age-related amyloid, where that transthyretin protein can fold upon itself, forming this amyloid and most commonly depositing in the heart and some of the soft tissues. So moving on to um, if a provider actually considers amyloid, they might not screen right or do all the right testing. So again, the key is thinking of the diagnosis. And so that's, that's important. And if that's done, then what do you do next? And so clearly uh, history, physical exam, asking a lot of questions, but one needs to screen for monoclonal proteins using serum immunofixation, urine immunofixation and the free light chain. And if there is no monoclonal protein, then um, we are not thinking so much about AL amyloid or light chain immunoglobulin amyloidosis, but maybe uh, ATTR wild type or ATTR variant or another type of amyloid, amyloid like fibrinogen or LEC2 or different sorts. And we'll talk more about how we make that diagnosis. But on the left-hand side here, if the monoclonal protein is present, then we need a tissue diagnosis. And we typically start with a bone marrow and fat aspirate looking for amyloid there. And about 85 to 90% of times, uh, if it is AL, you'll find it there. Um, and so then you're going to do typing and figure out which type of amyloid it is and, and move from there. Um, but if that's negative, then it depends on how high your clinical suspicion is. If you think that this person, gosh, even though those tests were not showing amyloid, but it smells like amyloid to me, then you have to go and you typically will biopsy the affected organ, for example, the heart, um, which is a little more risky than a bone marrow or fat aspirate, but hey, it's important and it's not that risky. And you go from there. If it's negative, then you feel really good about that. But there was this very important collaboration that was published about seven years ago where this idea of always needing a tissue biopsy to make a diagnosis of amyloid was turned on its head. And this is basically a collaboration in which um, it became known that you can, in a proportion of ATTR patients, make a diagnosis of cardiac transthyretin amyloid without a tissue biopsy. And um, the, the take-home message was bone scintigraphy enables the diagnosis of cardiac ATTR to be made reliably without the need for histology in patients who do not, do not, do not, do not have a monoclonal gammopathy. And in the absence of a monoclonal protein, the specificity and positive predictive value for cardiac ATTR in patients with a high grade, grade two or three cardiac uptake approached 100%. 
And this is just showing you the top uh, row is showing you a positive uh, PYP scan uh, by SPEC. And the bottom is also the SPEC just in color uh, imaging. But this 3D PYP is 2.36, which is very positive in this elderly gentleman. So ATTR, he had his gene sequencing and it was wild type. So this is ATTR wild type amyloid and he can be treated appropriately. And a number of cardiac societies have come up with various algorithms. Each color represents a different sort of pathway. They actually, especially the orange and gray, share a lot in common, but it, it's where and when the monoclonal protein study is done and the, the scanning is done and so forth. Um, but the long and the short is if you have a monoclonal protein, you, you need a tissue biopsy, even if you have a positive um, nuclear scan in your heart. But Again, how do you find a monoclonal protein? What is the right testing? And so uh, I'm looking for a monoclonal protein in the serum. You need a serum protein electrophoresis, but free light chains and an immunofixation or um, it, some institutions can do what's called mass fix, but, but you need an immunofixation. Um, and what that means is if you look at the colored panel in the middle of the slide, there's three different um, sort of boxes there. And you can see that there's sort of one column uh, that's labeled S S SPAP or serum protein electrophoresis. And then to the right, that's immunofixation. And each of the different panels, um, the first one is just what we call neat. It's straight from the, you know, the tube um, and pipetted in. The other is a one to 100 dilution. So again, looking for really low levels. How well do you do? And the last one is a one to 200 dilution. Well, if you notice where the red arrows are in the top box, you'll notice a very nice sharp purple band uh, next to the red arrow on the SPEP um, lane, uh, which is great. And that's a nice large M protein, which most amyloid AL patients do not have. Um, but then you can see the immunofixation. You can also see that nice band there. Um, but if you go down to the next one, which is diluted one to a hundred, you see that protein electrophoresis shows you nothing. There is nothing there. There's no band in that same area where we had seen before. And even the immunofixation you see in the M channel, basically that uh, column, there is a line going horizontally there where the red arrow is in the um, next to it in the, the kappa lane. Um, you don't see a sharp band. <laughs> excuse me, you see what we call a polyclonal band. So again, um, what you're seeing is that, uh, that the um, immunofixation sees things that the protein electrophoresis won't. And in the next dilution, um, you see virtually nothing for both tests. With the mass fix, you can dilute down and see it very clearly. But the importance to know is that the protein electrophoresis is a 40th as sensitive as the immunofixation. And so you need that test to exclude the monoclonal protein. And for amyloid screening, you have to do an immunofixation of the urine. Um, and, you know, some people will say, oh, I screened, I did it with an SPEP and a UPEP. I'm done. No, you're not done. You also need the free light chains, which aren't shown here. Uh, people tend to do better and remember to order those. And so this was that algorithm, but we know that 10% of AL patients will be have a, a positive um, scan, uh, technetium scan. And that we also know that 20 to 30% of ATTR patients will have a monoclonal gammopathy. So again, what that translates to is if you're thinking, is this ATTR cardiomyopathy um, in 70 to 80 percent of patients you'll get away without doing a tissue biopsy just by having negative proteins and a positive scan. Um, but why might there be discordance between the technetium imaging and the tissue? Well, you could have false, false positive scans. Um, so if people do planar imaging without SPECT, um, you can uh, make mistakes because you can call things positive that aren't. Blood pooling or a bone can be overlaying and confusing you. Uh, a myocardial infarction could confuse you. AL can confuse you. Even hydrochloroquine toxicity can confuse you. There's false negative scans. 
um, uh, which um, would be early stage disease or certain ATTR mutations can basically give a negative scan. And then it could be a different type of amyloid involving the heart that could actually also give you a negative scan. A false positive biopsy or a false negative biopsy most often is related to um, your pathologist not being very experienced or very good. So, uh, you know, not having good controls and so forth, um, or sampling error is another possibility. So when isn't a tissue specimen required for amyloidosis diagnosis? ATTR cardiomyopathy with positive scintigraphy and no monoclonal protein with appropriate screening, but all other instances require a tissue diagnosis. Um, once the Congo red is, stain is positive with green birefringens, are we done? No, you have to type the amyloid. Because remember, I said there's like 40 proteins that can, can uh, form amyloid in humans. So we need to type the amyloid. So to type it, is mass spectrometry required? I would say in a perfect world, yes, because we know that we can get into trouble with some of these other techniques, but immunohistochemistry is used at some places. Um, it, again, it depends on how good a user, a pathologist, how experienced they are, the actual antibodies they're using to do the testing. Immunofluorescence is a little better than immunohistochemistry, but you need frozen tissue. Immunoelectron microscopy isn't available at most places, and mass spec uh, is becoming available at more and more centers. I would say it's the gold standard. Um, and, uh, you know, it is a commercially available test. It's done uh, basically where you have Congo red in the left upper corner. Um, you see the Congo red, you do laser micro dissection, some processing, bioinformatics, and then some uh, it, you can get an identification report. So making a correct diagnosis of amyloidosis, algorithms are important. Critical thinking is essential. Red flags are complex. Anything complex, you have to go for tissue and get it right. So how do you avoid misdiagnosing amyloid? Well, there, um, a, there are some artificial intelligence algorithms that might heighten awareness. And how do you make the right diagnosis? I think that um, that's around education and referring to amyloid centers and perhaps in the future, some electronic medical record algorithms. And with that, I'd like to thank you. Um, this is our team in Rochester, but we also have colleagues that do amyloid uh, in Scottsdale and um, Mayo, Florida as well. Thank you for your attention.